večer svima i dobrodošli na temer, tema broj 5 i nastavit ćemo dalje ovdje na Engleska, znači tek tu izve, naš gost, gost iz uh, strana. Uh, so, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to Tina number 5. If uh, any of you didn't heard, uh, Tina idea started about one, one and a half year ago. And uh, we wanted uh, to organize a conference, basically something different uh, that you couldn't see uh, in Croatia and I don't know, and outside of Croatia. So we wanted uh, to bring, bring speakers, uh, foreign speakers, not from Croatia, here. And uh, we wanted uh, to organize a dif uh, different atmosphere, uh, something uh, more that, more that uh, visitors can feel like they are at home. And that's uh, how we got the name Tinal. If some, uh, some of you don't know it, it's, uh, it basically means something like living room or the guest room. So I want to have, uh, every, welcome everybody to our guest room and uh, feel comfortable to drink beer, sit, do anything you want and try to listen to our guest here, Hugo. Uh, so, and since uh, Sina, Tina started uh, uh, up, uh, in the January of this year, and since then we hosted uh, four meetings, and this is the fifth one, and also we averaged uh, great uh, numbers, oops, my bad, just a second. <laughs> Probač, deo da je full screen, ne? And, ok, so we hosted four teamers, and since then more than 200 people visited us, and we average great numbers in beers, it's close to three beers per person, also we ate like a quarter of pizza and seven cakes. And of course, anything of that, and this weird thing you can see here, and on my colleagues trying to hide it back there, wouldn't be possible with our sponsors, and of course, uh, the stream wouldn't be possible with our sponsor there. So our sponsor, our, our pizza sponsor is uh, Pivnica Paolo Guna, which you can visit at Zenta and try many different food. It's great. I, I suggest you try and visit it. Also, we have a cold beer in the fridge back there, if you want to take it, uh, thanks to our sponsor, Split Craft Lab. Uh, also, our dessert partner and uh, responsible for the cakes, thematic cakes for every tenor meetup, uh, Biber and Cakes. And uh, the last one, it's our stream partner, Startup Hire. You can watch uh, the videos from the Tina, this Tina and the Tinas before on their YouTube channel Startup Choir. Uh, so after Tina started, uh, we tried to bring uh, many diff different persons spe here, speakers, and uh, which, uh, which should speak about uh, different teams. So by now we had uh, four Tinas and uh, every, every Tina was based uh, on the different, different team. So on the first dinner we could hear about uh, the, the speech from uh, Pavel Jedrievsky, building a business with open source. Uh, you can watch it all of this uh, the dinners before on YouTube if you want, you can check it there. Uh, then after him we had a, des a design team, designer's team, design is a beautiful uh, error by Nemanja Jeklička coming from Serbia. Also, then on the next dinner, Harry Roberts from the UK came here and uh, he had a, a very interesting speech about why fast matters. It was uh, like a developer's dinner, it was very interesting also, you can check it on YouTube. And the last dinner we had before this one, it, is, it was from Ryan Weaver, a symphony, a symphony core developer, uh, it was about uh, symphony flex time. Uh, and you, well, you can also check uh, that uh, speech on the YouTube. Uh, so before I uh, say something about uh, today's speech and our guest here, uh, the next time uh, on the Tino 6, we will have uh, 
James Boy uh, speaking about executive your digital uh, business strategy. And you can see the date there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today, I hope everybody is ready for the theme of number five. Uh, our guest here, uh, Ugo, is, uh, is a front end developer. He's coming uh, from Germany, Berlin. And he's from, I think he's from the French, yeah, right? <laughs> say, say yeah, he is working at uh, N26 company based in Berlin. He is also nominated, nominated for the developer of the year by the Met Awards. He is also a member of the global, global network called the Google Developers Ex Experts. And uh, in free times he is speaking on the conferences and also he is writing books. And he's a co-author of, uh, from these books you can see here, CSS3, Practique, the Design Web. I hope that was good. It's and, good. Yeah, my friend sucks. <laughs> and John starts. Uh, so, nice. yeah. so today you can listen to his team. It, uh, it's called Claire and stop being soon. And uh, I will leave my stage to you, Hugo. Thanks. Can I just give you this? Can I the cable is here? Oh, cool, thank you. All right, once more. The classic. Uh, no, 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 no. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I. All right. All right. Try to stay here. Um. Hi. Try now. Should be good. Does it work? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, can you try to switch slides? Yeah. Uh, yes. You you spoiled the, the second slide. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Uh, right. So hi. I was that. Um, that is uh, that is my first meetup. I've done a lot of conferences, and it's the very first time I talk at a meetup. And this is very. Uh, <laughs> This is very weird because um, I'm very close to you right now, so I feel very uncomfortable. Um, usually, you know, based on the stage and everything, I'll try to just uh, give me a few minutes to just feel a bit more, a bit more uh, at ease. Um, right. So, how do I start this? Um, so, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm French. I live in Berlin, but I'm French. Nobody's perfect. Um, I, uh, I work at N26. Uh, N26 is a bank. Um, they sponsored me to come here today. So I have to tell you that we're hiring, um, and uh, I'm, a, I'm an accessibility, accessibility de developer. Uh, practically speaking, means I'm a, a front-end developer, uh, but I'm the one pissing people off to <coughs> make everything accessible and, and uh, inclusive. Um, and uh, I'm just before getting really into the talk, I'll just give you a little story of how I get to write this, this talk and books over the year. Um, I, was at, I, was, I was at the conference from the front a few years ago, uh, 2015 or 16, I can't remember. And, um, and I, was, uh, I was speaking there. So um, one, of the, one of the organizers, um, Marco, gave me his phone number. So I could, I could get, in, get in touch in case. So I wrote, uh, wrote his phone number in my, uh, in my phone book. <coughs> Uh, and I didn't know his last name, and so I wrote it as Marco from the front in my phone book. And when I had to um, when I had to call Marco because I needed something from him, um, I it took me a while to find him in the, in the phone book. 
because here was an F <laughs> for some reason. Um, it means that my uh, my phone at the time uh, was uh, was putting Mako, whatever, Mako from the front at front comma Mako from the front, which is a very weird thing to say, um, a very weird assumption to make on a name because it means that you assume that everything after the last space is the last name. And in this case, it was completely wrong. It took me a minute to just find uh, Marco in my phone book. Um, and uh, this, is why, this is why I came to a name this talk like this. Uh, I was with my friend at that point. He said, yeah, clever, comma, stop being so. Um, so this is, uh, this is the name of the talk. This is how I got to um, investigate and do a lot of research on user interfaces and the way we provide data to those, uh, to those applications, those programs, those uh, websites, and how they use the, this, this data, and sometimes, most of the time actually, wrong, um, and we have this kind of uh, odd situation, right? Um, so that's, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the gist of it, right? Uh, asking for information is, um, is, is everywhere now. Um, most of our life is now online. Um, whether we like it or not, and a lot of things, uh, a lot of things we do online consist on forms. Um, you're probably all on Facebook, I guess, uh, or almost all of you, um, and so you know, you know how many forms we can fill all day. We know, you, you know better that um, you you spend your your night just giving more and more data uh, online, and um, and it boils down to uh, asking this info is surprisingly hard, actually. Um, Asking misinformation is um, is hard because it's hard to how do I phrase it? It's hard to ask the correct information and asking ask, asking it in the right way because uh, sooner or later you end up asking it in a way that can harm um, diversity and inclusivity. Uh, so this is kind of the what, I, what I'm going to talk about today, um, and yeah, so. That's my pitch line. Uh, we are all terrible at asking data, um, at least at least uh, in our job online. Um, we are very very bad at that, and I'd like to kind of challenge the way we do things and maybe leave you with a little of, a, of an idea that spins on the back of your uh, on the back of your head. Sorry, so that next time you build a form or you contribute to that, you can realize that uh, maybe there are better better ways to you know to work on this. So. Um, I'd like to talk about two big topics tonight, uh, name and gender. Why those two amongst all the kind of information we, we can provide online? Uh, the reason is that they are usually the two first pieces of information you want about someone. Uh, when you meet someone, um, you usually ask about the name and you usually have an ID of the gender of the person, right? So, of course, um, there are many more topics we could cover, but those are the two, the, the two big ones for tonight. Um, so, let's start with a name, and uh, I really like I really like doing this talk uh, over the over the world and in different countries because I learn every time a lot of things on names. You know, uh, names are, are just fascinating. Um, but usually online, when when we ask for uh, for, for the name of someone, uh, we ask the first name and the last name, right? You probably all have had to fill a form like this. Uh, what is your first name? What is your last name? And I find it very odd because when is the last time you had a conversation like this? Where you say, hey, nice to meet you, a real conversation, I mean, hi, nice to meet you, and then the person would be like, hey, what is your first name, what is your last name? This is such an unfriendly and really robotic way to ask for someone's name, right? You would, not, you, would, you would not ask that. You would just ask the person's name and they would reply whatever they want to reply. So, right. So we can do better. We can do better than that. And before getting really into how we how we can do better than that, um, I'd like to take you with me on a little world tour. Um, we're not going to do 200 countries because I have only like 40 minutes to do this talk. But uh, we'll we'll have a few stops around, around the world to see what are the, the naming conventions. Um, um, and uh, you'll see that it's uh, it's very it's very interesting um, the the assumptions we have around names. So the, our first stop is Iceland. Iceland is very nice. Who has been in Iceland here? Ah, right. <laughs> um, Iceland is very nice, and outside of you know the, the beautiful uh, panorama, 
Um, the interesting piece of, of information they have about, about names is that they don't have family names, they have what we call patronymic. A patronymic is usually, uh, at least in Iceland, is the, the parent name followed by either daughter or son, based on whether the person was born a boy or a girl. So it's not, it is not the last name in the uh, family name in the, in the conventional sense, right? Um, if you take this person, for instance, Björk uh, Goodman's daughter, um, Goodman's daughter, so Björk is our given name, right? And Goodman's daughter is a last name, which is the patronymic here. Uh, and this person would expect to be called either by her, her given name, so Björk, or by her full name, so uh, Björk Goodman's daughter, but never Mrs. Goodman's daughter, because this translates into Miss, the daughter of a man named Goodman. Um, so they, again, so interesting thing here is that um, in Iceland, family name don't really exist. This is a patronymic. Um, and this is not specific to Iceland. In Malaysia, we have the same thing, except the, the format is slightly different. But again, it's not a family name, it's the parent name, usually the father, sometimes the mother, uh, followed, uh, following bin or binti, whether, whether or not the, the person was um, born a boy or a girl. Um, so, taking a, a person called um, Isa bin Osman, they would expect to be called either Isa or Isa bin Osman, or sometimes the, the bin or binti can be shortened, so Isa Osman, but never Osman, because this is the name of the parent. So, first thing first is, family name doesn't, doesn't really work everywhere, or, and even if, when, when we talk about uh, online interfaces, and where everybody comes from everywhere, uh, Family name is probably a bad way to handle internationalization. If we go to, uh, to China, um, China has a lot of different particular literal names, and I had to pinpoint just a few of them. But one interesting thing is they have what we call the generation name. Um, the generation name is a name that all siblings from the same family will share. Um, so it's not a given name, it's not a family name, it's just one name that is common for all brothers and sisters and sometimes cousins of the same family. So for instance, if you take, and this is where I practice my Chinese, because uh, I did this talk once and then someone said, yeah, we don't pronounce it like that. So, um, Mo Jedong. Um, uh, in this case, Mo is the, is the, the family name. Dong is the given name, and Je is the, is the generation name. So all brothers and sisters, all siblings, will share the same um, generation name, Je. Um, so in formal communication, this person, um, you would refer to this person as Mo Chan Chang, uh, which, is, uh, which means uh, Mr. Mao, uh, but not, ne never uh, Mr. Jedong, because again, this is the given name and the generation name. If you were, uh, if you were a familiar or like a friend with the, the person, you could refer to them as Jedong. And in this case, the generation name is part of the given name. So that's a little tricky. Again, there's no quiz at the end, so don't sweat it. If you don't, uh, if you don't remember everything, that's totally fine. Um, and they have, the, the other interesting thing they have um, with Chinese name is that uh, they have the Western name. And the Western name is, uh, is, is not an official construct. It's, it's a name that um, Chinese people working in uh, Western, Western Europe or even the US or having a lot of uh, relation with um, a country from the Western Europe or the US will, will take to kind of ease communication. Uh, so for instance, I, um, I knew someone called Jin Peng uh, living in France um, and to, to uh, make it easier for people, including the administration, to handle the name uh, he went by Jean Pierre, um, which uh, yeah, I mean, that's a that's also a very old name in France. So, but I don't think he knew that. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, um, the the interesting thing here is that the the name in use is not necessarily the official one, uh, and uh, and it also doesn't necessarily reflect the alphabet you would expect uh, the name to be in. Um, if we go in Spain. Spain, like a lot of uh, Hispanic uh, country, has a, a, a culture around having multiple names because they tend to use both the name of uh, the name of both parents. Um, so, um, usually starting with the, the name of the father, but it depends. Spain and Brazil, for instance, have um, have um, 
uh, different rules on that. In, um, in Spain, the name of the father comes first. In Brazil, the, the name of the mother comes, comes first. Um, so if we take um, if we take a woman called uh, Maria Jose Carreño Quinones, not bad, huh? <laughs> um, I did I did Spanish at school. Um, she was born uh, so she was born from a senior uh, senior Carreño and uh, Senorita Quinones, and here um, this person would expect to be called. Senorita Carreño. Uh, it means that the first, the first of the family names is the one to use. And if we come back to the, the terrible uh, uh, Android experience from at the beginning of the talk, where they just split on spaces and took the last part, then this would be wrong. Because I would expect to find um, uh, Maria uh, as Carreño in my uh, textbook and not uh, Quinones. Um, going to France. Please appreciate how I didn't put Paris as a background for France. Um, did, did someone ever go to France here? Paris? Yeah. All right. <laughs> if, you, if you ever want to go to France and really want to enjoy your trip, go to the Alps. It's much nicer. Um, I am not biased. Uh, French, uh, French names are pretty boring. There's nothing very nice to say about French names. Uh, but there, there is a, like a particle construct that is called the particle or the aristocratic particle. This is a um, this is an old construct that was used a lot uh, a while ago to um, to uh, show the, the position of lands or titles or no nobles and things like this. Uh, so some families ditched it eventually. Some families want to keep it as a <coughs> mark of legacy or something. Uh, but if you take this name, this uh, this uh, for instance, to uh, Jean de Jouvencourt. In this case, the is the particle, um, and it is part of the last name. So um, you can't just omit it when using the last name. Um, you can't you can't call this person Monsieur Jouvenco. It would be it would be wrong. Speaking of titles, um, in Germany there is a, there is quite a strong focus on academic degrees and, ti and titles. And so if you go if you read the press uh, and um, uh, talking about German people with either um, a doctorate or, uh, or professors or things like this. Um, it is important to use those titles, at least in uh, in official communication. So, for instance, if you were building a profile page uh, and you were using collecting and using titles, uh, it would be important to uh, reflect that and use them um, because um, it, it is part of the German culture around that. Um, yeah, man, I don't have many countries left. So I think two. Uh, two or three. <laughs> Um, in, in Vietnam, um, the, the given name, so well, my, my given name is Hugo, the given name can be used in formal context. So um, this is not the case, for instance, in, uh, in France, in Germany, and probably, I guess, probably here as well. Uh, the given name is not used in formal context, it's the family name that is being used. But uh, in, um, in Vietnam, it is. Um, so uh, the former Prime Minister, if I'm not mistaken, Nguyen Tan Dung, um, could be uh, could be referred in the press as Mr. Dung, which is the, gi the given name, um, dis despite you know having a full last name and uh, and middle name and everything. This would be completely legit and uh, and happened uh, in quite. A, if you read if you read some press around this person, you could you could still see that uh, happening. Um, in in Thailand, um, uh, something slightly similar is they use nicknames. And you'd think, yeah, everybody uses nicknames, um, but no, they, they use they use like off, like pseudo official, official nicknames, you know, not just for friends and family and, uh, and romantic relationships. Um, like they get assigned basically basically assigned a nickname, and then this nickname is used in official contexts and informal communication and so on. So again, uh, former prime minister Yingluk uh, Shinawatra had uh, had the nickname Pu, uh, which means crab. And, uh, but she would also be referred as uh, as as this nickname. So it's uh, it's really it's not just a, like a like a playful thing that you would <coughs> do with uh, with friends and family. It's it's a legend thing. Um, and the, la the last stop, our last stop. Um, I'd like to continue, but I I, I gotta get to the point eventually. Uh, our last stop is India, and uh, the thing with India is. Um, it is so big and rich and with so many cultures that I could not pinpoint any like real um, like specific example. So instead I'm just gonna list everything you can find in Indian names. 
Um, so you have family names, but you also have patronymic. Um, sometimes you have the location, so the birthplace, the, the city of, or village of birth inside the name. Um, you might have the caste in the name or the religion. Um, you might have initials. When I say initials, it means that the name being too long, they shorten it to have initials and discompose a new name. And, and when you take all of that, we just see, and you want to add more things to it, you also have marital names, which, you know, um, some people want to uh, take the name of the husband or the spouse, some people want to hyphenate, some people want to have a space between them two, some people want to switch uh, or whatnot. You have people with uh, middle names, it's, um, it's something uh, uh, very common in the US. Uh, and you have people with a single name, it's, it means no you know, first name, last name, just a single name. Uh, it's not as uncommon as you would think. Anyway, uh, right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty complex. And uh, as, um, as uh, uh, Washta Butcher say in, in the book, technically wrong, Names are just plain weird, you know? Like, you can't really just find the perfect algorithm to validate names. Um, like we've seen in just 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, um, going around maybe 10 or 12 different countries that rules are different, um, legacy is different, history is different, the people come from different backgrounds, and you can't really just find one pattern to fit them all. And this pattern is not first name, last name. So, how about we don't do that? So how about we don't ask for the first name and the last name? Uh, and instead we could have a unique field, like just one field to, to mimic the, the, the usual interaction that we have when we meet someone. Hey, what's your name? And then the person decides what to, what to say back. So we could have this on the web as well, have a unique field. Um, with no length restriction. Um, I never really got the, the point of restricting length. Uh, especially, I never got a point, and this happened in, in, in a few companies I worked at, where we said, yeah, names are at least two letters long. Like, we probably a few back-end developers here, right? All right, so, okay. um, is, is, there any, is there any point in, in saying at least two letters? Is it any easier to store than one letter? I'm not, okay. I, uh, you know, I, I did this talk for time. Every time I'm like, I should still check that. Um, okay, so, so um, two letters, uh, restricting to at least two letters is not making it any easier. And for, for some people, it makes it much worse because um, single letter names uh, exist, and there are a lot of them. And, um, and while they are quite uncommon with a Latin alphabet, uh, you can find it quite easily in, in different alphabets, especially Asian ones. Um, so single letter names uh, should be should be accepted and long name as well, like really long, like you know, 50 characters, 60 characters, 70 characters, 80 characters long. And again, I would argue this is probably not much harder to store to you know just allow 80 characters. Um, and again, if if we take if we take uh, someone coming from Spain, for instance, where they have uh, two last names, so uh, comp compound names and then two last names if not four, sometimes it also happens when you take the name of grandparents, then you, you quickly fill those 50 to 60 to 70 characters. So, handle long names. And, speaking of characters, don't restrict characters. So, uh, kind of handle every character you can, uh, except Unicode is huge. Unicode is insane. So, uh, at least try to not be too restrictive with it. So, uh, saying, yeah, we only accept Latin, um, Latin uh, alphabet is probably wrong. Uh, also, you should accept uh, uh, letters with accents. Um, I've learned a lot about all those accents that uh, there is in the Croatian language here. Uh, so I guess a lot of you probably have uh, have had problems with you know filling a form where the letter was not was not accepted. Um, and also, I handle uh, punctuation. So you know um, dots, commas, um, quotation marks, um, apostrophes, all of that. Um, this is probably a big one, uh, a name. Uh, don't say your name is invalid. There's no, there's no good, there's no, no way that works. Like there's no good, good situation where you can say, yeah, this is probably not a valid name. Um, like that's okay to not be able to process it. That's not ideal, you know. But that's, uh, that's pretty fine. Uh, but yeah, by all means, don't say 
if this name is invalid, you have to pick another one. This is not how names work. Like, you, you can't do that. Um, so just say, again, if you can't process it for any reason, um, you know, a bit of defensive, pro defensive programming is not too bad. Say you just can't handle it. Um, it. It happens, and then maybe you give a hint on what could go wrong. So maybe there was um, an uh, uncommon character or a non-Latin character in there, or a number, for instance, I don't know. Uh, and, and maybe just give hints for the process <coughs> to be able to fix that. Uh, but yeah, don't say it's invalid. Um, and uh, all in all, don't try to be too clever around that. So um, I do understand that having a unique field with no length restriction, no no character set restriction, and basically being completely free on that is not ideal when you have to use that name later on. Um, because if the full name is, is incredibly long and complex, maybe you don't want to start all your email by dear and then, you know, like, 120 characters of names. Um, so maybe one way to do it is to, on top of having a, a, a full name field, having one to ask how we should call people. So picture that, for instance. You would have you would have two fields. So instead of first name and last name, instead of that, you would have the first field that is the full name, no restriction, go nuts, do the full thing. Um, use the alphabet. Um, you will your official alphabet, um, and then. And then how we should call you, and then here, this is where you can apply maybe a, like a few restrictions based on what you're going to do with that. So if it's to print on a dashboard, for instance, then you might not have so, many, so much room. So you can say, okay, we're going to have to limit that to 25 characters, for instance, right? Or you might say, well, we can't, we can't really handle uh, non-Latin uh, alphabets in our UI for some reason. So please only use you know, those, these character sets, things like this. Um, this, by the way, is a recommendation from the W3C, the, the, the web standards, uh, on, on handling names when in an international context. Um, but I would argue this is not really about internationalization anymore. It's just, you know, again, we can't really validate names. Um, so the best way is to just cope with what, what the user uh, provide um, and, uh, and maybe just have a, like a backup to, you know, use this name in interfaces, dashboards, emails, communications, and things like this. Right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to my second topic, and I never found a good transition for that. Like, um, if someone wants to give me a, like a, a clean transition between those two parts at the end, just feel free. Um, but you know, since we are like a small room and we're like you know, quite close together, is there any question on the names? Otherwise, we can also do them after. Go for it. That's, that's definitely a, a trick question on this, and 
It's um can artificial intelligence solve this problem? Well, the problem is that in the first place we did the, we applied the wrong constraints to names. So the artificial intelligence here, we should say, well, everything is a name and everything is basically valid. So this is this is tricky, and to be entirely honest, I'm not versed enough into the, the machine learning and artificial intelligence topic to really be able to provide like a full answer on that. Should we move on? Right. Right. So, so my second topic is uh, is gender. So we talked about names, and and then there's the topic of gender. Um, I know some people, some of you probably find this, this topic interesting, some people probably have opinions, uh, opinions on that, some people find it not interesting. Um, the point here is not to, to, to pass my own personal agenda on this, it's just to kind of um, challenge the way we consider gender um, in the society and on the web. Um, and again, I'm not expecting any of you to just like, start doing everything different tomorrow, but you know, just keep that in, in the back of your mind for whenever the topic comes up again. So, uh, historically, we always treat gender as male and female. That's that's always been pretty much the, the gist of it. Um, um, even though we, we knew that it was not that simple, uh, for uh, for sake of simplicity, we always kind of said, well, gender is binary. You know, you have a male, female, and that's pretty much it. Um, well, as we as you probably know, uh, this is this is not always that easy. Um, uh, nothing is, and again, we, we come back to you know the topic of nasal again, like. This is not that easy. You can't just find a perfect algorithm for that. Um, and I think I think a lot of things we do wrong on 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 the on the topic of gender. And this is not because we are malevolent or because we are uh, we have like uh, strong opinions against uh, certain things. It's more that uh, the terminology is always a little bit blurry, right? Um, so um, the very first thing is that gender and sex are, are different, and that's I think the the the, the thing we get the least as, as a society, we just struggle with that concept. Um, but gender and sex are different, and on one end of the spectrum we have chromosomes, and I'm not gonna give a biology lesson because uh, like high school is very far, and I have, uh, I have uh, very few uh, memories of that. But on, very, on one end of the spectrum you have, uh, you have chromosomes, and then, and then from that you have sexual characteristics, and those come up uh, from birth, but then even during puberty, and those are things like um, so uh, breasts, uh, external genitalia, um, you know, uh, facial hair, morphology, and things like this. Um, then you have the gender expression. The gender expression is how um, how someone expresses their gender to the world. So uh, this is usually the first thing you notice um, when you meet someone. It's their gender expression. Uh, and then you have the gender identity, and this is basically the thing that trumps everything else. And this is how the persons identify themselves in society. So that's, that's basically the, the, the terminology around it, right? Um, and, and based on that, we can see the, 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 the misconceptions that we, uh, that we just roll with on a daily basis. Uh, the first thing is that we, uh, and this comes up to, to what we just said, um, so gender and sex are different, and gender is not binary, um, despite what a lot of people believe or want to believe, um, it, it, it just doesn't work that way, uh, it's not that easy. And um, the, the, the smallest and simplest uh, reason we can, we can pinpoint that is that even sex is not, uh, is not a binary thing. Like a lot of people every year are born what we call intersex. Um, and in, in some countries, uh, intersex is recognized as, a, as an official sex, so on an ID card you would, you would have this person registered as intersex. Um, but then, in most countries, basically, a baby born intersex uh, is going under immediate surgery and then uh, kind of reassigned either uh, male or female based on the doctor's um, wish, basically. Um, and um, another, another uh, moving on this topic, is another thing is that um, transgender in itself is not a gender, it's an adjective, so it's, you know, someone going from one gender to the other. Um, so you can't say someone is a transgender. This is just uh, it just doesn't doesn't work this way. This way, um, and um, and uh, something we, we hear a lot. So transgender. This is such a, like a word that is not new at all. But something we, we hear more and more, I guess, is the word non-binary. And those, while uh, while you know having overlapping uh, characteristics, are um, are kind of uh, 
um, in, in a way different. Transgender is, is uh, an, uh, an adjective char characterizing a person going from one gender to the other. Non-binary is, um, is a term um, defining someone whose gender doesn't stick to the usual, you know, the, the so-called binary model. So now it's either man or woman. Um, and the most important thing of it, um, it's kind of like, you know, like don't say the name is invalid, is also, well, you don't get to decide about any of this. Um, like, this is just the way it is, right? Then we can, we can uh, understand and we can, we can comprehend what people go through and what people want and what people, you know, what are their reasons. But in the end, we don't get to decide. Like, we don't, the same way we don't get to decide to say someone's name is invalid. We also don't get to decide uh, how someone should identify themselves. So, from from there, uh, what do we do? Um, and this is uh, this is where this is where it's also really not that hard to you know make it slightly better at least. So let's take the worst case scenario. Um, so this is the, the typical the typical form. Uh, it's, a, it's a mandatory field for gender. It says male and female, and you have to pick one to move forward. All right, classic, we've all been there. Um, and, and you know, for most people, it's probably super fun. Like, but again, we build, we build UI and products and projects for everyone, and most people is not necessarily good enough. So the first thing, and this is not specific to gender, this is, this is, this is applicable for any kind of information online, is ask if you must. And I know this is hard because we all work for people who work for investors, uh, who needs tracking and a lot of data. Um, and I know this is hard to just go to your boss and say, hey, maybe we don't need that info. Uh, but on a, on a general topic, you know, any kind of information, you should ask it if you need it. You should, you, you should not ask it for, you know, uh, curiosity or legacy reasons or things like that. This, uh, when it applies to gender, it always, uh, it always remo remind me of this, uh, this, uh, this comic from a uh, web comic name. Um, it says, uh, I'm not sure of your gender. What gender are you? I need to know. Oh, no. um, so yeah, does it matter? That's the real question. Like, do this information matter? Do you need it to run your program? Um, and if you do, which is totally fine, um, you know, we, we do need to have some, some, some information. If, if you do, then you should say why. Uh, the reason, the reason why, is that some people might decide to go with this information or to give a different one based on what you're going to do with it. So, uh, in this case, the, the form from earlier, we have this, uh, this sentence at the bottom saying, "This information is required by a legal department to ensure, ensure com compliance to terms and conditions." Admittedly, this is quite a shitty way to ask. Uh, this is quite a shitty reason to ask for for gender, right? But at least you know it says why. It says it's for legal reasons, there's a link to terms and conditions, people can read them. <laughs> like, like someone reads terms and conditions, but you know. Um, but at least, you know, you said why. Um, of, amongst the reasons why you should not ask uh, gender, and uh, again, it's, it's also uh, um, a good, uh, good advice for other pieces of information, but amongst the reasons you should not is advertising. Um, this is usually why we ask it. Um, the reason why you probably should not is that, uh, well, advertisement is sad. Um, and also, like, gender-based advertisement is usually pretty flawed. Like, um, it's usually either offensive or just completely wrong. Um, and the second reason, the, like, I think the main reason why you should absolutely not ask this information for is if you plan on declining services based on the answer. This is actually illegal, and uh, if your company or product goes through an audit, can get you in several troubles. And again, this is not specific to gender, it's, uh, it's for any kind of information. You can't decline to provide services based on someone's gender or name or ethnicity or things like this. Um, reasons why it's probably fine, you know, it's like, uh, it's up to, uh, up to discussion, I guess. Uh, if you build a social profile, actually this is perfectly fine when you build a social profile, but we get to a little subtlety right after. Um, and another reason is third parties. We all work with third parties. Um, and sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they ask uh, the, our users uh, for a lot of information, so we have to kind of proxy all that and ask all this for our advertisers. Uh, for instance, this is the case uh, why we, we ask for gender during the sign-up process at N26. 
you would uh, you would think, you know, mobile bank, why do I need to provide my agenda to just open an account to have some transaction? Just because behind that, we, we, have, we have been audited and we have partners and we have to provide this information to our partners. So third parties are, um, are always a complex topic and sometimes, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. And probably a good reason to ask uh, gender or, or again any piece of, of information is when you want to monitor diversity. So uh, when you want to see how many people use your platform, when you want to see what is the ratio between men and women on your platform, for instance, uh, you want to see how many people from uh, underrepresented groups or minorities are using uh, your products, and based on that, you know, kind of uh, encourage diversity and things like this. So this is always a good reason. Um, so coming back to the, the point of social profile, and um, again, if you, if you use Facebook, this is probably something you're already aware of, um, you should always clarify the privacy of information. So um, in the case of our form, we just uh, say that this information will remain private because it is required for legal reasons. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is actually a, like an important point. Um, unfortunately, we live in a society where uh, Non-binary and transgender people are going through, you know, harassment and harassment campaigns, and are being uh, attacked and uh, discriminated against. So, asking for this information and then making it public uh, is it can have can have like uh, dire con uh, consequences. Like for some people, it can be a real problem. Um, so, it's perfectly fine to ask for it, uh, but. In this in this scenario where it's 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 a tricky tricky, tricky topic, it's not just like asking someone's name. Um, you should always uh, clarify if you're going to use this uh, for private um, purpose or if it's going to be public for anyone to. <laughs> um, moving on a little bit on on copy. Uh, again, we go back to the, the point of uh, we made earlier in the terminology section. The transgender is not ideal um, because transgender is is an adjective, so. You, you know, you can't pick between men, women, and transgender. Um, what we can do, however, is instead of asking for male and, and female, we can ask for men and women, because this has, um, just by this simple tweak, it's usually more inclusive, because um, uh, transgender uh, people will be um, included in men and women, but not, not necessarily in, in male and female. So it's um, subtle, but it can make a little bit of a difference. Um, um, again, coming back on this, uh, provide a non-binary option, so updating this form, so we can ask for man and woman, and then non-binary, it is as simple as that. Um, then it doesn't mean you have to store it like this on your, on your back end, like if, if you want to store it as unknown or things like this, it's up to you how to or you, you know, store this data, but from the, from the, the visual perspective it's probably, um, probably the, the good way to go. And of course, if you can, uh, provide a way to skip. So it can be either not making this field required at all, or it can be uh, having an option that says I prefer just not to say, um, which, which, which is perfectly fine. It means that people might not want to give you this information because they don't want you to have it. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't have to, you know, to be like all, uh, all, all uh, like, you know, super formal. Uh, I remember this, uh, this form from a few years ago. Um, says, how should we address you, a lady, a gentleman, and then there's a long uh, answer which finishes that um, with, uh, it is my own business, sir, and I bid you good day. Um, so of course, you know, you can, you can uh, always, um, you know, uh, enjoy the writing some copy. Um, however, avoid the, the, the word other, which is alienating. Again, this has nothing to do with gender. You, if you, if you, you know, group people, you probably don't want to end up in a group that is called other. Um, it's it's never you know it's not the nice thing to say. Um, so um, the the last thing, the last big tip on this, but I know this is the hard one, so this is why please by this. Uh, provide the free, the free text option if you can. Um, so you could keep everything, but then provide a, a way for someone to uh, handle um, just write whatever they want. Um, and I know this is hard to to process. Free text is always hard, so maybe you could have um, suggestions. This is, what, this is what Facebook does, for instance. Uh, when it comes to gender, uh, they have just one text, they don't have, they don't have like a huge option of things like this. One, one field, and when you start typing, they just um, pre-fill with whatever they, have, they can. Um, so they can, they can basically put whatever on this. Um, um, 
Last, uh, last little thing on, on the topic of, of gender and again when it comes to building social profiles and things like this, um, there's, there's the, the point of pronouns. Um, so it's usually, it's, I mean, we usually guess, but it's usually good until it's not anymore. Um, so when you build a product, you might want to ask uh, which one which one to use. Uh, again, Facebook does it pretty well. So they say, hey, what, uh, which uh, which pronoun do you, want, do you want to be referred to? And then you can pick uh, feminine, masculine, or neutral. Uh, they give you an example, and again, they uh, they give you um, the, whether the information is public or private, which is always nice. Uh, if you build uh, interfaces in, in English, uh, English has the has the nice thing of having a, a gender neutral pronoun. Which is they singular they. It is uh, it is official. It is not a, it is not a trend. It is something that has been completely uh, active and everything. So you should probably default to uh, to to this uh, gender neutral pronoun. Um, this tree is always good. Um, call people they by default. Singular they is not only right, but it also annoys us. <coughs> it's always a good uh, good reason to do something, I guess. Um, to wrap up a little bit on the on this topic, not not exclusively gender, but also. Asking information online and you know all that. Um, again, uh, a, a quote from Technical Wrong, this this uh, book. Um, when 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 you get told over and over again that you don't fit on a form, that you know your name is invalid, that your gender doesn't exist, that whatever else, um, eventually you start to understand that you don't fit in a community, you don't fit anywhere. So. Every time I've, I've been giving this talk, um, someone came to me after and said, this is usually good enough, you know? Like, first name, last name, and man and woman is probably good enough for most cases. And as I say, so yeah, it's, it, it is, from your standpoint, it is probably good enough. It, it covers probably all, most of your users, if not all your users, you know? Um, but for, for those users who are constantly reminded that they don't fit in whatever society want them to fit in, um, this is getting this is getting a real problem, and and then when we go further into the, the point that we avoided with uh, with names is when those kind of bias uh, and those kind of mistakes get um, get built into algorithms, then you have a bigger problem, and then you are scaling the problem instead of scaling the solution. So. Um, all in all, when you when you build those UIs, when you build those projects that you work on, um, try not to assume anything. Um, try to um, try to just ask the information you need and and just accept the answer people give you. Uh, it doesn't mean validation is a bad thing, <laughs> of course, validatory, but uh, but uh, you know accept people the way they are um, because um, there is no there is no average. Um, if you take if you take a, like a, a set of, of characteristics to describe individuals, like I don't know, like 10, 10 different characteristics, and then you take a huge pool of data, and you build an average profile, right, with that, uh, with those characteristics. And then if you compare that average profile to your pool of data, no one will match it. So average is a good is a good metric, but there is no there is no one matching the average. So everybody, everyone is an edge case. In, in one way or the other, so just got to accept people who they are, um, and this in the in the time of web and you know and you know being a developer and being doing front end or design or PO or uh, whatever contributing to the building a product um, uh, for the web is it goes into this like um, what what I call aid, uh, which is accessibility, inclusivity, and diversity. So it's a uh, sort of this bundle of topics that when 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 met together uh, creates. Um, the web for everyone. Last thing, um, last thing is um, on, on, on this topic, I recommend, uh, really recommend Technically Wrong from um, Sarah Washta Butcher. Speaking of names, <laughs> struggle a little bit on this. Um, and it's a fantastic book on not only, you know, not only uh, collecting data, but also what, uh, what, what uh, algorithms like Facebook and Google do, do with this data, um, how what we can do to make it better and, and things like this. So, um, thank you very much, and keep, keep building uh, nice products for everyone.
one way to do it. I like it. Um, yeah, I mean, in a, I mean that's basically the essence of it, right? If you can, if you can not ask for anything, then you know shit gets better. But it's not always the case. Like, I, what do you do for a living? You developer, designer? Come again? Okay, so I guess you work on different projects. If you go to your product manager or product owner and say, well, I suggest we don't ask for anything anymore, I hardly think he's gonna say, yeah, 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 yeah let's do this. Well, from a programmer's perspective, it's the lazy way, so it's the better yes, solution. Yes, 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 agree. Okay, the lazy one is better. Yeah. Not a you Google, not a you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can, if you can avoid to ask for things and just uh, roll with, you know, basic copy that works for everyone, sure, why not? Yeah, but it's not human. It is, uh, yeah, it's not human, exactly. You are from the bank, so how did you collect? <laughs> Sorry, just come again. You are from the bank, so how did you collect all this information? Probably me, first name, last name, gender, and everything. Yeah, oh, trust me, we suck at that. <laughs> Uh, like I wish we just implemented all that right. Uh, we don't. We don't. Um, that's on my to-do list. That's on my long to-do list for 2018 and what I want, want to do at N26. Um, no, we we like like most um, like most products. We started with you know the idea coming from the developer or designer's mind, and we just roll with it. And then you have to deal with that legacy. For instance, for a long time, we could not store anything else than Latin characters for first name and last name. So, for instance, people um, people coming from pe oh, not even people <coughs> having a Turkish name, which is very common in Germany, uh, where we like the, the first country we launched, um, could not sign up. We could not sign up because we could not store their name, which is you know, it is it is a stupid uh, stupid thing, and it is very uncomfortable to tell your customer that you can't register because well <laughs> you know that accent <laughs> yeah, pretty much you, you know that accent on your name. We can't deal with that. So um, yeah, we don't we don't do that perfectly. So it is, it is hard because it's not just a design thing. You know, at some point when you have half a million customers and you have to kind of migrate all this data to a different format or something, then it's uh, it's definitely tricky. Yeah. We've seen in the introduction that your title is uh, the accessibility advocate. Can you just shed some light on what does it actually mean and what how does your it means nothing. Uh, it means nothing. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been hired as a, as a web developer at the entrance. Um, but then uh, our team is getting bigger, um, and um, we have different profiles, right? Everybody has their own uh, area of expertise, and um, and like in most companies I've joined, nobody knew anything about accessibility, and and people had very little care or knowledge or both about um, design, design, inclusive design or things like this. So, uh, because I started doing that a few years ago and started really getting interested in that topic, um, I kind of naturally just took that position at N26. And uh, in practice, it means that uh, I'm doing a lot of, um, a lot of um, quality insurance on this, just making sure that uh, we are uh, we are okay for screen for people using screen readers, for instance, or uh, we are we have a keyboard navigation working, or uh, work with designers to make sure that we have enough contrast contrast between colors um, that we can accommodate to colorblind people, to people with motion sickness, uh, post traumatic syndrome, uh, attention deficit disorder, things like this. Um, so it's. My job is not particularly different from any other front-end developer, it's just that I have a very strong focus on that um, and I kind of try to expand that knowledge in the company because it should not be just you know me uh, knowing that, it should be a common effort. So that's, that's just basically it.